there are places where it's easier to find trouble than jobs. Easier to become jaded than educated. Easier to fall back on the system than pull yourself up. In the face of so many obstacles, it's easier to make excuses than make something better of yourself. Or maybe that's just what's easiest for people to think. The fact is, there are more than 6.7 million young people living in the US who want to grow up to be more than just a stereotype. And the only thing they want from you is a chance. If you show them the way in, they'll show you their talent and motivation. Provide them with the tools and they'll make their mark as professionals, business leaders, and job creators. At Year Up, we see the same amazing transformation take place every day. We train bright young adults and connect them with good companies where 95% of our interns meet or exceed their manager's expectations. Better yet, 84% of our graduates go on to full-time employment or off to college. There are places where it's easier to keep doors shut than hold them open. But when we all change our minds about what's possible, we'll find nothing but opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. So the net title of this presentation is, is incentivizing employers to train and hire individuals from non-traditional backgrounds. So in order to, to consider that topic, I want to put forth two questions. Who has talent in America and in California? And where does talent reside in California and in America? In order for us to have that discussion and a robust conversation, I think we have to kind of come to terms and agree upon something that our presence at this conference this, these two days suggests we all agree upon. That is that talent is distributed equally in society, although opportunity is not. Is that something we can agree upon? Yes. Talent is distributed equally in society, but opportunity is not. And that's across race, across gender, across ability, across age. So despite that, a divide between the places and people where opportunity resides and where um, um, opportunities, the doors of opportunity have been placed historically, there is a divide. And that is a divide that has been created based upon a history, not of inclusion as suggested by the title of this conference, but of a history of exclusion. That history has enabled, perpetuated, and sustained a massive and persistent systemic failures that impact the lives of millions. And in the case of the population that Year Up works with, Opportunity Youth, that is especially true. We have more than four million job vacancies, vacancies in this country. And six, many, six, many, six million youth who are out of school and out of work. According to Results for America, in the Bay Area alone, there are 104,000 of these young people living in the area. And the fact that the, that gap exists represents systemic failures and at a dysfunctional market. And we know what happens with the functional markets. There's craziness, there's irrationality, there's poor employer behavior, there's limited coordination, lack of information exchange, and the lack of replication of effective policies, practices, and programs. So these systems require, these systemic failures require systemic solutions. Just tinkering around the edges, and it will not create a, uh, resolve the problem. Just, for example, raising minimum wage or focusing on labor laws and labor protections will not bridge that opportunity to divide. In order to bridge that divide, we have to think differently and transformally about the way we do business. And the way my colleagues and I at Europe think about this is there's three Ps, three shifts, three Ps that need to happen in this in, in, in our system. First of all, the three are 
We need to shift our perceptions, we need to shift our practices, and we need to shift our policies. First, shift in our perceptions. Those are those stereotypes, those prevailing perceptions of people, groups of people, entities, institutions, government, and politicians. They have to shift. The risk if we don't do that, the risk if we stay entrenched in these false perceptions is that we limit our ability to think differently, to build better relationships and bet new relationships, and to overall transform this dysfunctional system. An example around perception is we have to shift our thinking about what the goal is. It's not just college for college's sake. That is a mantra that is built upon a theory of action that advantages the privilege. For example, those who have the privilege enough to take four years out of their life, incur mountains of death, debt, and walk out without the jobs, the skills needed to get a job. The outcome that we need to shift toward and make keen in our focus is a job. A job, as my boss often says, says a WT, W2 rather, that, ha that grows over time. We also need to shift our thinking about business. business. Businesses and businesses cannot be seen as part of the problem. In fact, they have to be seen as part of the solution. Further, businesses themselves have to look at individuals from non-traditional backgrounds and see them as assets, see them as part of their talent pipeline strategy. And, you know, despite what the media tells you with regard to youth 18 to 25 who are out of school and out of work, they get it. I remember about 10 years ago, I was working for another organization, Jobs for the Future, and wrote a report called Making Good at a, on a Promise. It looked at NAIL's National Education Longitudinal Study data and followed a co cohort of graduates to see how they persisted through education and work. And what we find is that they get it. They're keen economists and understand that they need to up their skills in order to get a family sustaining wage and gainful employment. They are not a dis disaffected population. They are an available source of talent who bring a variety of qualities that employers need. Grit, persistence, work ethic, motivation, loyalty, as a matter of fact, we at Europe have partnered with an organization or initiative called Grads of Life to speak to employers, to get them to make, shift their perspective and mindset about this population, and, and to look at them as a part of their talent pipeline strategy. I invite you to visit the website, gradsoflife.org, where employers can see tools and other resources that help them build a talent pipeline strategy. The second shift that needs to happen is a shift around practice. This includes businesses and education training providers alike. And, and by education training providers, I mean from, from new innovators in the space to traditional players such as institutions of higher education, namely the nation's 1,200 or so community colleges across the country who play a vital role. They need to align their programs with employer demand so that participants are not just going through the motions and participating in the hoax of a program that won't result, result in a job. They need to, these programs also need to integrate technology to modernize instructional delivery and to enable competency-based education. Moreover, they need to reinvent crediting and credentialing and embrace the notion of prior learning credit and badges. For employers, employers need to imagine themselves as playing an essential role in creating the talent they need. Now, that means changing hiring practices, looking, shifting from focusing on history and instead focusing on mastery. It means shifting for thinking that a four-year degree amounts to being ready for the job and instead being very specific about the competencies needed to be successful on the job. Once that shift has been made, there is enabled an ability to have a very different relationship with education training providers. 
I point to this chart that imagines a talent pipeline strategy for employers where they partner with employers, with, with part uh, uh, education training providers, to assess the core competency needs for the job that they are hiring for and working with them to design a curriculum that actually allows the participants to gain those jobs. So an active role for employers in the education training world. Secondly, they need to provide work-based learning experiences so these young people and others of non-traditional backgrounds actually have the ability to practice this, to get feedback and to grow on the job. And you can do this through internships or to, and, and especially around the increasing focus around apprenticeships across the country. They also need to do something courageous and I would argue the right thing to do is hire these young people and others from non-traditional backgrounds. And if not, allow them access to their network to refer them, give them references, and otherwise help them embark upon a career on their own. And if you hire them, it's also a matter of giving them access to mentors, to ac allowing them to embrace the power of feedback and, and providing on-the-job training opportunities so they may grow and in fact engage and embark upon a career pathway. Lastly, we need to shift our thinking around policy. And that's where my work leads me most of the time. And, and I always, when I start thinking about policy, I want to disabuse people of the notion that policy is the answer. In fact, before we get to policy, we just need folks to do the right thing. Change your perspective and look intentionally at this population. Secondly, change your practices. There's nothing that says you can't do things differently. But in, in, in lieu of all that, policy does create the, the environment in which all this takes place. And it is, but it is necessary in order to enable the type of practices and programs that we think work and we know work to go to scale. So first of all, in policy, we need to shift policy to align the the funding that comes from public sources to employer demand so that programs are intentionally incentivized to actually design intentionally around career pathways that lead to a job. Secondly, they need to focus policy on building cross-sector collaboration that incentivizes businesses to engage with education training providers in the way I was speaking to earlier. That includes tax incentives for hiring, for training, it includes tapping into the, 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 the intellect and the knowledge and experience of intermediary organizations to help well-intended and effect, uh, uh, well-intended nonprofits and providers to make that shift in their own practice. And then they need to, policymakers need to engage poly, um, um, employers in a campaign to make commitments to hire folks from non-traditional backgrounds and then hold them account through spotlighting and public uh, release of data. Thirdly, we need to focus more on outcomes. Instead of funding programs in, per per in perpetuity without uh, kind of holding them to account for the results they are making in our communities, in our state and across this country, we have to create some fluidity around those resources. That looks like looking at procurement practices at the, in the public sector and looking at new ways in which RFPs in, are issued and administered. It means looking at Pell Grant and ways in which Pell Grant can be used in innovative ways to, pro, to fund non-traditional education training providers. It also means securing opportunity for all youth. And that looks like removing barriers to labor market engagement, such as ban the box, criminal record expungement, immigration reform. Now, there we have it. The goal is clear, a job. And this is, I would argue, one of the great challenges in our country right now is how to bridge this divide. It's fueling a lot of anxiety in this country and our ability to address it will effectively determine how well we do in the words of Barbara Jordan, ensure that America is as good as its promise. So three Ps, 
Let's shift our per perceptions, how we think about non-traditional populations. Let's shift our practices to think differently about how we provide training in, in this country. And let's shift our policies to more effectively create the environment where all this comes to scale. Thank you so much.